So uh, welcome to this session. Um, we are going to begin without uh, further ado uh, by uh, abiding by Tom Cunningham's uh, prohibition against Westernists at this symposium um, with a Victorianist, uh, Jamie Horrocks. Uh, she is Associate Professor of English at Brigham Young University that teaches courses on Victorian literature and culture and gender studies. And um, her research interests include Victorian aesthetics and the intersection of literature and art in the late 19th century. She's published on Oscar Wilde, uh, Virginia Woolf, the aesthetic movements, and Victorian periodical illustration. And uh, her uh, presentation is uh, titled uh, Wilde, Cody, and Transatlantic Celebrity. We finally got it right. Thanks. There you go, there's my title. Um, I uh, have just enjoyed so much um, coming to this conference. So many generous scholars and people that I've met and talked to over the last few days, especially as I do feel like somewhat of an interloper, um, not having done a whole lot of study in American studies. It's been really enjoyable to go to every single panel and learn new stuff. So today, um, I want to actually return to some of the issues that were explored um, earlier today in some of the earlier panels, if you caught those. Um, this morning, we were, we were listening a little bit about um, the popular circulation of Cody and some of the branding efforts of Burke. Um, and I also want to think a little bit more about some of the stuff that Frank was mentioning um, just before lunch this uh, earlier today about performance and performativity um, in the Wild West show. Um, I think it was also Jim he mentioned earlier today, um, as he was showing us some of the slides of um, descriptions of the Wild West show in the Midwest, before and after, right, the, the show had come through. And a couple of times people mentioned um, the show as a kind of circus. Uh, Jim also said, you know, you, people were thinking it in terms of uh, minstrelsy or a minstrel show. And that's really interesting to me as well, um, as, as you sort of think about how do you understand something like the Wild West show, right? You have these sort of models, or, or folks in the 19th century would have had these kind of models. The circus, it's like a minstrel show. It's like maybe a traveling theatrical troupe or something, right? But you, you would have had to rely on sort of these, these patterns or these models um, to make meaning out of something new like the Wild West show. Um, so I'm particularly interested in that idea. And I'm also really interested in the idea of how the brand of Buffalo Bill um, consolidates itself, where and how that happens, and after what patterns or models um, that actually happens. Um, and that's what got me thinking about uh, Oscar Wilde. So most of my research, as Frank mentioned, um, ha has to do with British figures. Um, and so Oscar Wilde has come up several times in my work. And one of the things I find really interesting, and I've always found interesting about Wilde, is um, his American tour in 1882. And even those of you who really enjoy uh, Wilde may not know that he toured America in 82, started in New York, spent almost the entire year, um, hit a little more than I think 150 cities, um, and went all the way to California and then all the way back across um, the United States again and wrote extensively about this tour. Um, so I want to think today um, a little bit about his tour of America in the context of Cody's tour um, of Britain and of the UK in 1887. And I want to start out today um, with a very sad joke. Um, this joke will not leave you rolling in the aisles, but it appeared in 1882, so it's a very old joke. Um, it appeared in the Los Angeles Daily Times, and I've made a copy for you. 19th century paper, so it's kind of hard to read. Um, but this little joke reads, last Saturday, a gentleman well known in commercial circles rushed madly home about lunchtime and calling excitedly to the partner of his terrestrial joy said, wife, I've seen him. Seen who? Said his unsyntactical superior fraction. Why, Oscar Wilde, of course. 
met him on Spring Street, all dressed up in long hair, knee breeches, yellow cravat, and everything. Gimme clean collar, quick. And straight away, arraying himself in the white vest and his best sunflower, he meandered his way toward Baker Block, unconscious that the party he mistook for Oscar, the esthete, was none other than Buffalo Bill, the Comanche scout, who was laying over at Los Angeles a day or two to have a jamboree all to himself, all right? Um, not at all uncommon in the 1880s to see little articles, newspapers, um, even illustrations making fun of this sort of mistaken resemblance of Oscar Wilde, who of course is in America in 1882, and Buffalo Bill. Um, we saw this cartoon um, or illustration a little bit earlier. A and um, so I want to start off thinking about this strange relationship. It's a relationship that uh, a scholar named Daniel Novak has called a bizarre parallel. And one of the reasons why it is so bizarre is because that despite the fact that Oscar Wilde and Buffalo Bill are compared all the time in the literature of the 1880s and 1890s, and I'm talking the, the popular literature, especially periodical literature, newspapers, handbills, that kind of thing. But despite the fact that they're compared all the time, the two men have almost nothing in common, right? The quintessential Victorian British esthete, who is actually Irish, but that's okay, he sort of represents Britishness to Americans, right? And the quintessential American frontiersman, coming face to face in this lovely illustration. So the humor that accompanies an illustration like this, or uh, the little squib that I just read, isn't at all unusual. And sometimes I think that humor can mask um, some of the unexpressed rivalry uh, between these two men. Um, there's these cultural tensions that existed in the during this time um, that one scholar, Paul Giles, has described as a thoroughly transatlantic aestheticism and the notions of national identity circulating within a global network of empire. And thinking about the relationship, however, just as kind of a rivalry or as an expression of these tensions, complicates um, their relationship. And it also obscures certain things about their relationship. Um, one of the interesting things that does get complicated when you think about these two figures together is the fact that when Wilde arrived in America, one way that his performance of Britishness was made meaningful to Americans was by locating it within a discursive space already occupied by Cody. And it was Cody that American commentators drew on to explain or to contextualize um, Oscar Wilde. And five years later, when Cody then in turn went to England in 1887, it was Wilde, Wilde's manipulation of the press, Wilde's deployment of body and brand, um, and especially Wilde's cultivation of celebrity that Cody then drew on in his own transatlantic tour. So in this sense, Wilde is both precedent and antecedent to Cody, and Cody is both precedent and antecedent to Wilde. Such intertwined co-reliance suggests that the narrative of Cody's transatlanticism cannot be told fully without Oscar Wilde and vice versa. What Cody offered Wilde at the outset of Wilde's tour was a readily legible version of Americanness against which British aestheticism could be posited. And what Wilde in return offered Cody was a model of national identity that simultaneously acknowledged the constructedness of categories of nation and self and other and also asserted their authenticity. For Wilde in America, this model served the characteristically Wildean purpose of unsettling the notion of a stable identity. Um, and for Cody in Britain, this model provided a means by which a performance, right, a spectacle of stagecraft that everybody knew was a spectacle of stagecraft, might also be regarded as an authentic expression of national identity. So I want to think about this a little bit further. First by briefly talking about Wilde's 1882 American tour and then turning um, to Cody's 1887 tour of the UK. So the theatrical sensation that was Oscar Wilde's lecture tour through America's major cities was a performance enmeshed in national identity uh, from the very outside set. From the moment that he arrived in New York, Wilde represented himself 
and was represented by the American press as symptomatic of a certain kind of national identity. One newspaper, uh, The Nation, acknowledged this, um, reporting Wilde's arrival to the United States, where he suggested, or, or this reporter suggested, that Wilde's foreignness, what this reporter called his extravagant otherness, would spell his failure in the United States. However, it's his very foreignness that made Wilde's booking agent and American manager, a man named uh, Colonel W.F. Morse, certain of Wilde's success. So although Wilde's principal lecture on, on this tour trumpeted a cosmopolitan vision of art that created a common intellectual atmosphere between all countries, the popular discourse that surrounded Wilde in America continually asserted his otherness, his difference ever the opportunist, Wilde used this to his advantage. And he shifted his persona uh, depending on the different audiences that he faced. And he thus constructed an identity that was very elastic while he was here in the States. Wilde's performativity, the way he performed, lay at the heart of this construction. And indeed, performativity is central to the form of celebrity that informed Wilde's performance or performs wild construction of identity here in the States, and also Cody's when he went to Britain. So American commentators often emphasized the artificiality of Oscar Wilde's performance. Uh, they used terms like posing or posturing to preclude the possibility that there was anything authentic about the man and his message. But at the same time, his stagecraft could and did convey, in the minds of a lot of 19th century spectators, a powerful legitimacy um, a scholar named Lynn Voskel has written extensively about Victorian theatricality and has explained that um, on both sides of the Atlantic during this period of time, there developed this, what she calls, a, uh, um, excuse me, a sophisticated capacity to act authentically and be theatrical at the same time. Now for us, for modern spectators, we can't imagine a performance, an actor, um, as authentic in any way. We always know that what we see on television in the movies and the media is a performance. And then with that, we, we discount a kind of authenticity. But in the 19th century, that wasn't necessarily the case for spectators. Many people wrote um, about the idea of some sort of core theatrical element being a key or a window into that individual's authentic sense of self. So in the 19th century, it was not at all uncommon for theater goers, circus goers, melodrama goers, or participants in the Wild West show, to occupy the space that's both spectacle, fakery in a sense, stagecraft, and an authentic expression of whatever was being expressed on stage, in the, in the case of the Wild West show, kind of American frontiersmen, at the same time. Now, it should be immediately apparent why this model of identity, the idea of identity as a kind of performative act or something created in process, why that would be particularly interesting um, to Cody as it was to Wilde, right? By 82, Wilde had done practically nothing. He had not published the comedies, the society dramas that he's famous for today. He had not become um, famous as the kind of epigrammatic critic that he was to gain fame for in the 1890s. He had published, published this little tiny volume of poems, but it kind of didn't matter, right? Because what Wilde established on his tour of America and what Cody likewise adopted on his tour of England was a performative model of identity that recognized the impossibility of embodying any single or stable category and that welcomed the persona as a legitimate expression of self. So Wilde's performances throughout the West were strange and unique in that the further Wilde traveled from the East Coast, the more American, in the sense of a sort of Western, he became. And what you find in the periodical press is all of this description of Oscar Wilde, as here in this Harper's Bazaar um, image, adapting and conforming himself to become quintessentially American. Um, for example, in the press, Wilde acquired hip boots. You can see these hip boots that he would wear all the time, supposedly. He was made an honorary colonel in the Texas Rangers when he was in Galveston, Texas. In Dallas, he adopted a white hat that Colonel Wilde, as people started calling him, 
um, was advertised in the local newspapers as an Oscar Wilde hat, right? In one newspaper, he was described, um, this is a fabulous description, as wearing a large, wide-brimmed, white slouch hat from which fell long, light brown hair, reaching in somewhat straggling masses to his shoulders. Wilde became, by the end of his tour, a sort of bizarre simulacrum of Buffalo Bill. And so you can see why in the newspapers these two figures were constantly brought together, even though they have so very little in common. These two men should have been, and in many ways were, completely antithetical, right? But what Wilde did, as he cultivated a certain kind of celebrity throughout the United States, was provide a model for the kind of celebrity that Cody could also promote and embody um, on his foreign tours, or even on his, his national tours as well, right? Cody was well aware um, that his version of Americanness, or the version that he presented to his British audiences, was mythic, fabulous, in every sense of the word, right? And yet, he continually promoted the authenticity of that experience at the same time he promoted its theatricality. Um, one of the ways um, that Cody did this was by modeling his own efforts, his own sort of creation of brand, his own publicizing self on the things Wilde had done when he was in America. So let me show you a couple of photographs where this becomes immediately apparent. This is an early carte de visite of um, William F. Cody, you can see, taken by a photographer, an American photographer, um, named Napoleon um, Cerrone in New York City. You can see this is early in Cody's career. He's very active, alert, leaning forward, posed in his you know, familiar getup. Um, in 1882, when Wilde came to the United States, he also engaged Cerrone um, to take what have become probably Cerrone's most famous photographs, uh, these photographs of Oscar Wilde, right? So this is the 1882 photograph. And interestingly enough, when Cody went to England on his tour in 1887, he commissioned a new series of photographs, they didn't look like the Buffalo Bill of those early cartes de visite. In fact, they looked a whole lot like Oscar Wilde, which is very funny, right? If you think about sort of this aestheticist pose that Wilde has, lounging, kind of this example of indolence, luxuriating in the textures and the patterns of the cloth around him, that's not the Buffalo Bill persona. And yet here we have a lounging, kind of indolent, uh, displaying himself for the camera, Buffalo Bill. Let me show you another example. This is um, an example a little bit later, uh, about 1894, of William F. Cody, once again modeling himself, his own persona or brand, after those early photographs that Wilde had taken um, when he came to the United States in 1882. The similarity, um, the coat, the pose, the stance, is remarkable. And it reminds us that you know when we're looking at a cultural phenomenon like Buffalo Bill, thinking about the ways that he established himself as a brand, right? An individual became an identity or kind of a, a sort of corporation almost, that there are almost always models or patterns upon which that kind of celebrity is based. And what I find particularly interesting is that Wilde provides such a fascinating model um, upon which Cody's own celebrity uh, draws from and becomes based himself. So thank you.